Does archaeology back up the Bible? In the Bible we find a lot of historical events mentioned and sometimes in great detail. Compared to the Bible, the science of archaeology is relatively new. So the question is, are the two in agreement about events? As I mentioned in my intro, the Bible has a lot of history within its pages. In fact, it's probably fair to say it has more history than any other type of information. If we want to find out about an event that we were not an eyewitness to, then there are a number of things we can do. If the event was recent and you can talk to a witness who was there, then you can interview that witness or better still, a number of different witnesses. For example, our legal system relies on this approach. If the event is too far back in time for any witnesses to still be alive, then we need someone to have recorded the details from that time. This is what the Bible has in abundance. In the event of not having a written account to resort to, then the next best thing to do is to go and search for it and see what you can dig up. Often, literally. This is where archaeology comes in. Now, not all archaeological evidence is all about finding written material. Though, of course, that is fantastic. No, it's also about finding pottery, tools, jewellery, burial grounds, buried buildings and much more. All of it which has a part to play in building up a picture of the facts pertaining to that time period. Now, here is the crux of the matter. Archaeology is fairly new science, only dating back to the 19th century, while written history goes back to the actual event, hopefully. If the written history says one thing and then archaeology finds contrary evidence, then we have a problem. For example, from ancient times it's been believed that Julius Caesar invaded Britain in 55 BC and then again in 54 BC. If archaeology turned up data that said that Julius Caesar never landed in Britain and that he sent a lower officer, then that would be very significant to historians who would probably get very excited and have lots of discussions and debates about whether this is true and what it says about Caesar. Another aspect of the archaeological science being a relatively recent process is that if the archaeological discoveries backs up what the historical account says, then it cannot be said that the historical events have been changed to bring them into line with the archaeological evidence. That is with the historical ev events predating the archaeological evidence by sometimes thousands of years. For many hundreds of years, the Bible was the best source to find out about ancient history. Sometimes it was the only source. So the question remains, does the archaeological evidence, archaeological discoveries, back up the biblical accounts of history? The answer is a very emphatic yes. There's simply not enough time in this one video to cover all the recent archaeological discoveries, but I will cover just two of them in the many accounts in the Bible. What I will do is put a link in the description below to a website for the Associates for Biblical Research and also to their YouTube channel. I will also put in the description what it says on, the, on their About Us page, a space permitting. But the first paragraph says this. The modern science of archaeology, which began in the mid-1800s, has revolutionised our knowledge of the ancient biblical world. Many archaeological discoveries relate directly to scripture and confirm the history of the biblical record. Other discoveries provide fascinating background material for the biblical narratives. As people are made aware of these discoveries, the Bible suddenly comes alive and Bible study is made more interesting and meaningful. Today's technology has enabled archaeology research and publication to be greatly accelerated. More information is now being produced than ever before. It is even hard for professionals to keep up with the most recent developments. That is why the Ministry of Associates for Biblical Research is so important and valuable. Our staff of professional archaeologists are actually producing some of the latest research and in addition we stay in communication with other scholars active in the field and get the inside story on recent developments. For my first example I'm going to discuss one of the Assyrian kings. There are five Assyrian kings mentioned in the Bible 
but I'm going to talk just about King Sennacherib on this occasion. This account is in 2 Kings chapter 18. This is a long passage and it contains a lot of detail, so I will concentrate only on the beginning and the end parts. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, King Sennacherib of Assyria marched up against all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. King Hezekiah of Judah sent this message to the king of Assyria, who was at Lachish. I have violated our treaty. If you leave, I will do whatever you demand. So the king of Assyria demanded that King Hezekiah of Judah pay 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. Hezekiah gave him all the silver in the Lord's temple and the treasures of the royal palace. Now note that King Sennacherib demanded 30 talents of gold and 300 talents of silver. And yet it says that Hezekiah gave all the silver that he had and it doesn't mention the gold. Now we can speculate on why this is. Maybe he didn't have 300 talents of silver. Maybe he gave more just to make sure that Sennacherib's army would withdraw. So later we read in the account, the king of Assyria sent his commanding general, the chief eunuch, and the chief advisor from Lachish to King Hezekiah in Jerusalem, along with a large army. They went up and arrived at Jerusalem. They went and stood at the conduit of the upper pool, which is located on the road to the field where they wash and dry cloth. So we can see from this account that Sennacherib was not satisfied with what Hezekiah had given him. Now a lot happens where dialogue takes place between kings, the king's advisers, where he mocks the god of Israel, then he has to withdraw, then he comes back with the king and surrounds Jerusalem. Please do read the full account, it's an amazing story. Then we read this at the end. That very night the angel of the Lord went out and killed 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When they got up early in the morning, there were all these corpses. So King Sennacherib of Assyria broke camp and went on his way. He went home and stayed in Nineveh. One day, as he was worshipping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons Adramelech and Shareza struck him down with a sword. They escaped to the land of Ariak and his son Esar Haddon replaced him as king. And that is most of what we knew until the first of three prisms were found by Colonel Robert Taylor on 1830 at Nineveh. Later, two almost identical prisons were found. They were written in the ancient Akkadian language using the cuneiform form of writing. It was deciphered about 1857. It had this to say, As for Hezekiah, the Judahite, who did not submit to my yoke, 46 of his strong walled cities, as well as the small towns in their area, which were without number, by levelling with battering rams, by bringing up siege engines, and by attacking and storming on foot, by mines, tunnels and breaches, I beseeched and took them. 200,185 people, great and small, male and female, horses, mules, asses, camels, sheep, without number, I brought away from, the, from them and counted them as spoil. Hezekiah himself, like a caged bird, I shut, shut up in Jerusalem, his royal city. I threw up earthworks against him. The one coming out the city gate, I turned back to his misery. His cities, which I despoiled, I cut off from his hand, from his land, sorry, and to Metina, king of Ash, Ashdub, Paddock, and uh, Silidel, and these I gave him some of his land, and I diminished his land. I added to the former tribute, and I laid upon him surrender of their land an impost, gift for my majesty. As for Hezekiah, the terrifying splendour of my majesty overcame him, and the Arabs and his mercenary troops, which he brought to strengthen Jerusalem, his royal city, deserted him. In addition to the 30 talents of gold and 800 talents of silver, gems, autonomy, jewels, large carnelians, ivory inlaid couches, ivory inlaid chairs, elephant hides, elephant tusk, ebony, boxwood, all kinds of valuable treasures, as well as his daughters, his harem, his musicians, were all brought to Nineveh, the royal city, to, to pay tribute and to accept servitude. He dispatched his messengers. What we have here is what we call propaganda. Sennacherib couldn't say that he failed to take Jerusalem, so he spins it, that he shut up Hezekiah in Jerusalem like a caged bird, 
no mention of how it ended with the death of 185,000 of his own troops. Now notice when he discusses the spoils of his siege at Lechish, he agrees with the 30 talents of gold that the Bible speaks of and clarifies that he got 800 talents of silver, even though this was far beyond what he first asked for. He still attacked Jerusalem and we see how that turned out. So that is one example of archaeology backing up the Bible. Let's have a look at another. This time we turn to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel has always been a favourite target to attack for some so-called Bible scholars. A common attack is to say that the book was not written at the time it's claimed, namely the 6th century BC. It is proposed that it was actually written in the 2nd century BC. Why? Because the book of Daniel has a lot of prophecy about the fall of Babylon and Persia and the coming Greek Empire and the Roman Empire and much more. So to a sceptic, sorry, sceptic, prophecy is impossible. Therefore, they reached the conclusion that it must have been written after the events described within its pages. Another claim that was made for many years was that the Bible has an historical error. It refers to this reading from Daniel chapter 5. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for thousands of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze, iron, wood and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. The king summoned the enchanters, the astrologers and diviners. Then he said to these wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around their neck and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. Finally, Daniel is called and explains to the king that he has been judged, found wanting and his time is up. We then read this at the end of the passage. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. That was the very night that the army of Cyrus the Great took the city of Babylon. So what is the problem? Well, the sceptics saw two problems. Firstly, all the Neo-Babylon history records that the last king of Babylon was King Nabonidus before the city fell to King Cyrus of the Medes and the Persians. Secondly, there was no record of the existence of a man called Belshazzar in any of the, those records. Then in 1845, four clay cylinders with identical inscriptions were excavated from Ur. These Nabonidus cylinders contain Nabonidus's prayer to the moon god for Belshazzar, the eldest son, my offspring. Thus, Belshazzar's existence was confirmed as Nabonidus' firstborn son and heir to the throne. Then in 1882, a translation of another ancient cuneiform text, the Nabonidus Chronicle, was published. According to this document, Nabonidus was a mostly absentee king, spending 10 years of his 17-year reign living in Temna, Arabia. The king left Belshazzar, whom the text called the Crown Prince, to take care of affairs in Babylon during that time. Also, the chronicle explained that Nabonidus was away from Babylon when it fell. Two days earlier, he'd fled from the Persians when they defeated him at Sippar. So Belshazzar was the highest authority in Babylon at the time of his capture. Next, a Persian verse account of Nabonidus is published in 1924, stated that as he started out for a long journey, Nabonidus entrusted the kingship to his oldest, the firstborn. So Belshazzar clearly functioned in the role of a king for the year while his father was away. Now knowing this, it explains why Belshazzar said to his wise men and to Daniel that if they could translate the writing on the wall, they would be made the third in the kingdom. 
they couldn't be made the second because that was actually the position that Belshazzar held and his father of course held the, the number one position. What is of added interest in this is that if the fact of Belshazzar's existence and position was unknown until the 19th century then it is unlikely that Daniel would have known in the 2nd century BC 400 years after the event. Aside from this there is other evidence for the earlier writings of the book of Daniel such as in the type of Hebrew and Aramaic scripts that was written in points of the 6th century. These are just two examples of the archaeological evidence in the Bible. May I draw your attention to the Associates for Biblical Research that I mentioned earlier for an awful lot more info on this important subject. I also feel that I need to issue a warning. The level of scepticism towards anything to do with the God of the Bible is staggering. Therefore, if you do any research into the subject of archaeology or any other form of science, take care to see through the double standards. A certain amount of scepticism is healthy, but it has to be done with an honest and open attitude. Otherwise, it just ain't science. Thanks for listening. Please feel free to, to like, subscribe and comment. And may God bless you in your search for the truth.